Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Moacir Ponte. I'm an associate professor at USP, Universidade de São Paulo. And I'm here with uh, Emilio Vital Brasil. Emilio? Oh, you have to unmute, you unmute Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I'm Emilio Vital Brasil. Uh, I work at IBM Research. I'm a senior researcher and manager. And today we'll be uh, sharing the uh, workshop of English application. Thanks, Emilio. So today we have a uh, morning, in here, at least here in Brazil, in the morning. Um, this workshop of English applications is a pleasure to be uh, chair with Emilio of this workshop at CBGRAPI 2021. And in order to uh, show our program here, we, we are uh, going to invite first uh, Marcelo Siqueira, which, uh, sorry, Vanessa Testoni, which will be our first uh, invited talk. After uh, Vanessa, we are going to have a paper presentation of the, our workshop, and uh, afterwards, the um, invited talk from Marcelo Siqueira. Uh, first, we'd love to, like to uh, thank the um, program committee and the general chairs of the CBGRAPI for uh, inviting us to chair this uh, workshop. Uh, also, thank the, uh, all the uh, supporters, and, uh, as, such as uh, Watec Academy, Papergs, CNPK, and uh, SBC, Woods, and um, for for the um, for for being a support for this this event. So, without um, more um, delay, here we are we, we are receiving we are having here Vanessa. Uh, good morning, Vanessa. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So I hope you can hear me very well and yeah. that you are also able to see my first screen. And uh, so um, thanks for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today in this industry related workshop, especially because there is an audience that's so much familiar with so many topics that are related to the talk, AR, VR, MR, point clouds, light fields a six DOF, three DOF. So I wanted to bring something new to the CIPGRAP community today, uh, something that's not related at all to any specific uh, technology or any specific research area that you can find on papers or other sources. And then I thought of discussing some aspects of this new immersive world that we are so much waiting for and that are related to the industry point of view. So I hope that by the end of the talk, you will have some insights or even maybe answers for some questions that we hear all the time when you talk about, about immersive, this new immersive word, and that I've heard even this week during the conference. So for instance, why AR and VR are not mainstream yet? So we see some technologies, some applications already, but it's not everywhere as we expected it to be. Uh, is it because of the headsets? They are too heavy, they are too uncomfortable, they are too expensive. Or is it because of the AR contents? Maybe it's not good or it's limited or it's not compelling at all. So from my point of view, I can, I can tell that the answer is yes for all of those questions. And the industry knows that for many years. But the reality is that there is so much more going on when a technology uh, is turned into a real world product. So today we'll look at it. So I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, I am the leader of the multimedia uh, team here at Samsung Research Brazil. Uh, but today I'm actually speaking as the Brazilian head of delegation for the SEC 29 community. So don't worry if you don't know what it is, we will talk about it during this talk. Uh, but it's related with standards that everybody knows, such as MPEG, JPEG, this type of standards. So I'm pretty sure everybody has heard about those. And we will talk about two areas that usually are not discussed in academia and not even in the industry in Brazil, which are international standards and patents. Okay. So I have been working for more than 15 years in topics related with that image processing image uh, streaming, especially image and video coding. 
But especially for the last five years, I got involved with this world of multimedia international standards. And I was able to learn a lot about uh, how tech companies made the decisions of turning technologies into real world products and what is required, what is the ecosystem that's required for that, how they plan the future, like 10 years ahead. So today I hope I will be able to share some of those learning with you and probably it's going to be interesting for everyone. So let's start by something that you already know about, right? What's your current situation? When we talk about video streaming, we already know that video streaming is the number one activity in smartphone. And while video is also the most used form of communication. So uh, I like to, I always like to look at numbers, right? So uh, when you look at the Cisco forecast, for instance, the Cisco forecast for 2021 was that we would have around 3 trillion gigabytes in our networks per year. The forecast also said that by 2021, we would have 82% of all internet traffic consistent of video. And it means that at every second, we would have 1 million minutes of video that would cross our networks. And then we had the pandemic, right? So everything changed. And uh, this only confirmed how much we currently rely on video. So it's not only for entertainment anymore. It's not just about video streaming, game streaming, um, uh, live streaming. This is about education. This is about relationships. This is about health, work, surveillance, uh, security. So everything now is video. And so now we have this super impressive adjusted forecast, a multi-billion dollar market that is expected to grow at a rate of more than 20% up to 2027. So this is highly impressive. I feel that those numbers are huge. But when I look at these other numbers, then I feel even more impressive. So here they try to predict what's going to be the required bandwidth in our future homes, connected homes. And if you look at the areas here, you're going to see that most of them are related with immersive scenarios. So for instance, you need to have 167 megabits per second if you want to have HD VR at your home, right? So this scenario, this much awaited VR, MR experiences um, has been promising a significant rise in broadband usage for many years, much before, much before the pandemic. So for instance, in 2019, video streaming was already considered and promoted as one of the main principles for the 5G technology, right? Why? Low latency, of course, higher bandwidth and higher speed throughput. So 5G is super connected to this new immersive world. So if you look at the 5G usage scenarios, for instance, uh, most of them are related with immersive experiences. And um, it's not a, co a coincidence that we are talking about this right now. 5G has been on the media for so many years, but actually only last year, the 3GPP, which is the standard organization responsible for that, was able to finally approve it, the final version of the 5G standard. And 5G is not only about smartphones or even video streaming. For instance, autonomous cars, the industry related with it, has already joined even the 5G licensing patent war. So uh, there is so much going on, as I just said, related with video. And um, uh, so I think that so far it's clear the amount of video that needs to be sent and stored, right? Uh, by the next years, it's gonna explode, really. So in order to make it happen, we must look at this required ecosystem, right? So we must combine multimedia with communications, for instance. When you look at some of the applications for this new immersive work, for instance, robotic telesurgery, you must have low latency. By low latency, we mean less than one milliseconds, right? Uh, of course, we must have a faster network. So this ecosystem uh, is composed of content, of course, so multimedia vi video, high resolution video, 8K, 360 degree video, holographic video. 
it's composed of codex. So as I said, I've been working with codex uh, for so many years since the beginning of my master, then PhD, postdoc, and even now at Samsung. So uh, from my point of view, the codex are really the magic of the signal processing world. Uh, if you look at the numbers today with the current codex, you can compress a video up to 600 times without noticing. So you, as a user, you were not going to be able to see that the video uh, undergone all this process. And in order to do this, we combine so many things. We combine statistical uh, algorithms. We combine information theory. You can very uh, a deep understanding of the human visual system. So all of this has been going on for more than 30 years. So this is the work of so, so many people and so many years. Uh, dedicated to evolution of the codex. So codex are very impressive uh, from my point of view. We will talk a lot about this today. Then, of course, you must have the transport format. You must have the network, as we have just said, 5G, for instance. And then finally, the devices, right? So autonomous cars, smartphone, smart TV, smart watch. Uh, and here I included, um, this one is very impressive, very much celebrate, celebrated by the industry. This is the first one commercial dense light field display that was released at this month. And uh, I'm not sure, probably you know, people talk about this a lot, but the holographic volumetric display displays like this, they are considered the, the real solution for this seamless reality blending, right? Of course, there is the cost of a huge amount of data that needs to be stored, compressed, transmitted, right? But um, this is, of course, one of the devices that must be included in this ecosystem, right? Um, so uh, I'm just talking about video because video is much heavier, but of course, audio and images are also included in this ecosystem. So usually when people talk about immersive um, work, they discuss these two ends, the content and the devices. So the device is expensive, the content is not good. But actually, there is a whole ecosystem that needs to work in order for these technologies to work. And uh, one technology that's fundamental for this is uh, the multimedia standards. So this is, of course, a multi-billionaire market. And we want that all of those pieces should be able to connect. So if you have an international standard, or in this case, several, you will be able to ensure the interoperability of all of those super heterogeneous devices, systems, and video on demand platforms, and all of the companies that are involved on the development of this uh, pieces of this ecosystem, right? So it's really important to look at everything in order to understand what's going on and why technologies have not been adopted, for instance. So since we're talking about standards, let's start with the most famous ones. I'm pretty sure you have heard of those, especially H.264, which is usually inside of MP4 format, right? So this started so many years ago, as I said previously, and usually those standards, they are done, This the, the, the previous ones, right? They are done by three main standards organizations, ITUT, ISO, and IEC, right? So that's why they have usually two names. So we had H264 AVC, H265 HEVC, and then the newest one, VVC H266. And the reason is because VVC, for instance, is the name of the standard for ISO, and H266 is the name of the standard for ITUT, right? So we will talk about this codex a little bit during this talk. You remember this, right? H264, then next the HEVC, and then currently VVC. So I like this picture because usually when people think about JPEG and MPEG, they believe they are just standards. And actually, they are not standards. They are groups, groups that have been working together for 30 years. So when you look at these organizations, ITUT, ISO, and EEC, the experts got together in joint technology committees and subgroups. So for instance, here we have the SSC 29, the one I just talked about at the beginning of my talk. And here you have JPEG. So JPEG actually means Joint Photographic Experts Group. And the joint is because it's a joint group from ITUT and ISO. 
And MPEG is the same. MPEG, it's not related with ITUT. Most of it's coded. Some of them are related, but it, it means Motion Picture Experts Group. So they are responsible for so many standards, MP3, MP4, DASH, HEDC, so many others that we know about. And they have been meeting together four times per year in meetings that usually last like the whole week. And uh, they have been responsible for the development of so many other standards. Not all of them became so famous as those that are included here, but there is a lot of, of work going on. So how does it work? I or, or anybody, we can just go to a meeting and participate and propose our solutions. This must be done. The, that is a regulation. This must be done by countries, countries represented by delegations. So in this case, in ISO, ABNT is our official ISO member. And for the ITUT part, it must be done by members represented by delegates. And in this case, for Brazil, Anatel is um, the ITUT member, right? Um, so if you are more familiar with uh, MPEG and JPEG, you must have heard, maybe have heard, that MPEG was over last year. And the reason is because last year there was a huge change for MPEG, the biggest one probably in those uh, third years. And the reason is because uh, the um, group has become too large and also there have been some issues after so many years working together. So they decided to actually split the groups. So now instead of one group, we have several. We have eight and eight um, ad hoc groups too. But they keep the name, in fact, the activities that are going on. So you have video coding, audio coding, 3D graphics. We talk a lot about this. Genomic coding, technical requires. Everything is still the same, but they are just organized in a different way. So if you have heard that impact has, you know, uh, was that last year, this is actually not true. So as I said, uh, you can just go there and participate. You must be part of a delegation. And actually, we, as Brazil, or as Latin America, we were not able to participate until 2018. So here in this map, you can see all the countries that are members, the blue ones, right? And being a member uh, means that we are not only able to participate in the meeting, we are also able to vote. So this is a very important task because every single standard must represent what is uh, the decision, what is important for the countries, where it's going to be used. So now we are also able to vote. There are several ballots related to all the standards that are, are in the development. And after we took some years to be able to create the delegation, I got together with several professors, got support from them. And then in 2018, we were able to finally create our delegation. And I was elected as the first head of this delegation. So now I am responsible for representing Brazil and what it wants in all these standards that are under development. Of course, we are not participating most of them because uh, we are super small delegation compared to US and uh, you know China, Germany, Japan. So many countries that have been there since the beginning. But still we are there and we have been making some small contributions already. So in 2018, the first Latin America contribution to any JPEG standard was done by us in a standard that's uh, named JPEG Cleaner. We will talk about this later. Uh, that was done by Samsung together with a collaborative project with a few universities. And we were also able to do the first Latin America contribution to MPEG in a standard that's called MMT. And since then, they, the Brazilians have been participating and even assuming nice positions, relevant positions, such as JPEG Technical Committee co-chair, co uh, chairs of other standards, and also leadership for some ad hoc groups. So as I said, uh, in order to do it, we must be regulated by ABNT in our case. So we have a commission in Brazil, which is this one that is here. All the experts are welcome. So anyone that works in any related area that I will talk about today can participate. And I've been conducting uh, four meetings per year, national meetings, but you know, it's super easy. So right now I want to invite everybody that's interested. We can, of course, talk about uh, this more late. So I said we would talk about two main topics, right? International standards and patents. And the reason is why those two things, they walk together all the time, right? So for instance, 
most of people they don't have any idea about this for instance how much do we pay in our our smartphones that's related to royalties to embedded technologies and in 2014 this paper tried to predict it what was the potential potential patent royalties and uh, they got to this number 30 percent so this is a lot of money for a single device and uh, that was composed first by the cellular baseband chip 3g 4g wi-fi the video codec operating system and the audio codec right so um actually when people were taking a look at it they said look this is not exactly true true uh we are not paying for all of those patents the companies are not paying all of those patents and the reason is why and that was clear in this other paper uh most of those companies they engage in what is called the cross licensing deals so uh the reason why uh companies feel patents it's not just because they want to charge royalties it's because they want to be able to cross license patents so they want to protect what they invented not really sell what they invented so this is the main reason why patents are filled and are so important in this world and then also this other uh paper uh, also very important to study in the area, they tried to say, okay, so how much is it? How much is it really that we are paying for royalties in a device? And they got to this number, more or less 3%. And of course, it's much less than the third percent. And this is a very important study because those numbers, they have been used not only to inform policies, but in many judicial decisions. So of course, you have seen in the media all the time, big companies fighting for patents like those are billionaire agreements and um, when the judiciary system uses those numbers for instance then we have a problem right but this is only for you to have an idea about how this business of patents is in, in the standards is important for devices such as uh, regular smartphones right so then uh, let's take a look at the codex itself and how it works on each of them so I've just showed you first codec that was, and this is still the main one, H264 was completed in 2003. So this is a lot of time ago. It's still the main one. And so, so when the companies that developed the, this uh, codec got together, they were able to collect uh, more or less 1,000 patents. And they were able, so there are so many companies, you can see here, most of them, uh, all of them are famous. I'm pretty sure everybody has heard of all of them. And they were able to get together and reach an agreement. So they got this patent pool called MPEG LA, and they decided, okay, this is how we will charge for the H264. Everybody agrees, and this was a huge success because if you want to use H264, you can just approach MPEG LA, for instance, and you know exactly how you have to pay for it. So there's no risk you're going to be sued later for some patent that you haven't paid for. So this is charged for uh, encoder decoder developers. This is charged for uh, patent uh, content distributors subscri that have subscriptions. Uh, this is paid for broadcast TV, for live streaming. So for everybody that uses the codex in so many different ways. H264 is still the preferred codec today. So if you go to YouTube, for instance, to upload the video, they will tell you, please encode this video with MP4 inside h264 and this is pretty uh, impressive for a technology that's from 2003 especially because there are other options so in, in 2013 we had hevc so 10 years later hevc is much more you know it's uh better you have higher compression it supports uh 8k and um it was not adopted as they were expecting so let's let's see why so first i will invite you to guess a number so here is the block diagram for the hevc i will not explain all these uh, topics it's not required but you can see that here you have transform quantization loop filters everything is here so try to imagine how many patents how many patents are here in the hevc technology remember for the h264 we had around 1000 try to imagine how many patents companies were able to fill out 10 years later considering all the increase in the interest of video and everything that we saw before so 
the re thing is that these companies, they were here are the main companies with patents. Most of the patents are legacy from H264. Not most of them, 30% of them, but it's a significant percentage. And uh, this is how the industry works in video coding. It's always an incremental um, advance. And this is because you must have hardware support. Of course, companies are um, interested in using the patents, but it's also because the design of a video codec, it, it doesn't change a lot for one codec to the other. And so what happened was that the companies were not able to get together this time. They were actually um, more or less able to organize themselves in three different patent pools that are here. And several companies were not affiliated to any patent pool at all. So if today you want to use HEVC, you actually will have to approach each one of those patent pools and each one of those companies individually to know how much you have to pay for their patents. So this is a huge problem. People, companies that want to use HEVC, they feel insecure. Of course, it's much more expensive and you have a higher risk of being sued later. So uh, this is the situation from last year. I asked you to guess how many patents. So 17,000 patents are now in the HEVC. So if you look at one of the patent pools, only this one has more than 10,000 patents. And not all of them are considered what we call standard essential patents, but most of them are, right? So this is a huge number of patents and a big problem for the HEVC technology. So when you look at this graph, you see, for instance, how many patents have already been granted per year for the 10 main uh, companies. And here you also see the geographic distribution for those patents. So you see that, of course, most of them are in US, China, Korea, Japan, but you also have some in Brazil. So I included this slide because I wanted to say, um, for those of you that think that this is not our problem, last year we already saw some judicial IP disputes over standard essential patents of HEVC, including big companies. Uh, many professors in Brazil acted as consultants for both sides, and that was done here in Brazil from patents that were filled out for these companies more than 10 years ago, but have been already granted by our INPI. So this is also going on here in Brazil uh, right now. Right, so HEVC had this big problem, but people didn't give up. And VVC is already here. So VVC is the newest code that it was completed last year. I included those two pictures, those two pictures. I took those pictures uh, from my first MPEG meeting in 2018. That was the meeting when uh, the companies were responding to the call for proposals. And I was very, very impressed because you know, um, these meetings, as I said, they stand for the whole week. It was more or less 10 p.m. and the room was packed. And uh, here are like most of the people that worked the papers that I was studying when I was a PhD student. So, and they are still there. And that was a huge interest, even with the problem that happened at first with the HEVC. So VVC is also a huge success, was able to compress more 50%. Of course, there is an increase in the computational complexity, but this is very related to what we are talking about today, immersive words. So three, 360 video, immersive XR, telepresence, low latest cloud gleaming, uh, 8K video. So everything you can imagine is here. It was included and it's supported by, by the VVC. Not everything, but most of the scenarios, let's say, right? And uh, this is, um, I included this picture because this is uh, the magic I talked about first, right? So let's just, let's talk about a full HD video, right? 25 frames per second. So this uncompressed means around 1.2 gigabits per second. So in 1994 here, when the first codec came up, they were already able to compress it by around 70 times. So it went from 1.2 gigabits to 60 megabits. After all those years, 25 years, right? Several people working, several thousands of hours. Now with the VVC, you are able to compress the same video to only two megabits per second. So this is more than 600 times. 
So this is a more or less the evolution of the codex over all of those years. And uh, I think it's really, really impressive. Well, of course, the PVC is also here with its patent pools, the same problem with HEVC. Uh, they, it's a starting, right? Um, they were able, not all companies were able to speak what they want so far, but they were already able to select two pools. So it's sure we will not have just one pool, it's two pools at least. So some of the companies involved are here. And uh, this is, I, I think this, uh, this information here is very interesting first because you can see that what are the most uh, the, the companies that are most contributors for this technology and how it changes from HEVC to VVC so we have Qualcomm, Huawei, we have ByteDance, ByteDance for those of who, who don't know uh, they are the owners of TikTok right and we see so many other Chinese companies that were not here before and other thing we also see are companies that were very much involved in the HEVC, such as here, Samsung, Microsoft, Sony, and that are not so much involved with BVC. And uh, the reason, uh, many reasons, patent problems, but also one reason that I will show next. And the reason is that there is competition, right? So uh, we call it competition in a polite way, but maybe we could call it, it's a code of war. So, Back when uh, the HEVC was starting with these problems for the patent pools, some companies, they got together and said, okay, so let's try to make a royalty-free codec, right? So currently we have all of those options and they are making a lot of noise. We don't have own options with MPEG. So let's look at some of them. Uh, so just to mention, I'm not sure if you had a time because this slide was super fast, but maybe you noticed that most of the new companies that are very much related with video, they were not there. So for instance, Amazon with Prime, Google with YouTube, Netflix, Facebook with WhatsApp, Instagram. And the reason is because they are, these companies are new. So 30 years ago, they were not there. They don't have this standard session patents. So they actually had to use those standards and to pay for the rights. So they got together and tried to say, first Google was the first one. So they started with VP8 in 2008. They tried to promote it as a free alternative, but actually, as we said before, it's super tough to do a codec from scratch without infringing any patents. And so actually Google uh, later, he started to pay license fees for the MIPEG LA to be able to promote VP8. Then 2012, they tried again with VP9, the same problem happened and besides that, they didn't have some much support. So for instance, Apple was not supporting the technology. So you couldn't watch 4K video on Apple TV or your iPad, for instance. And then finally, when we had the HEVC problem patent pool, several other companies got together and they said, okay, so now let's find found what we call, they call the Alliance for Open Media. And they come up with a codec that then was not supported just by one company, but several, which was named the AV1. So AV1 is available since 2018, and it's a, a nice codec. It's been has been calling a lot of attention. Uh, it's compared to AVC, for instance, and uh, for instance, Netflix is already streaming uh, AV1 videos since last year. And uh, here the difference is that if you take a look at the companies that are involved, you have several others. So and in all the areas, so you have browsers, you have uh, content providers, you have ship producers, you have mobile companies. So Amazon, Google, Intel, Samsung is also here, Mozilla, Google, Amazon. So um, it's a big alliance and they try to come up with this AV1 as a free, right, to free option. And um, some people say, super fine, if they can survive the, the legal challenges, probably they will change the industry forever. And this um, royalty-based codec development uh, history of 30 years will be over. And others say, nice, but what they are trying to do is quite impossible because this has been done uh, this way for so many years. And so many companies are investing, have invested money on this. And it's very tough to really uh, design a, a codec from scratch. And if you take a look at everyone, actually it follows more or less the same structure. It's a hybrid codec, you have all the blocks. So it was not a really surprise when this company called Syswell 
It's an intellectual property license company. Got together some companies that were owner of some patents related with AV1. Right now they have more than 1,000 patents and they are now, um, they, they now have a license fee for the AV1 that should be a royalty free codec, right? So uh, this was not a surprise for most of the industry, but what they are trying to do, if you take a look here at the companies, you will see that uh, they're very famous companies, Adobe, Ericsson, Toshiba, Interdigital, SK, Telecom, GE. And uh, so those are the companies who claim they have these patents uh, that are infringed by AV1. And what they are trying to do is that every time they try to find a patent that has been infringed, they invite the company to join the alliance because they have this agreement that the companies inside of the alliance, they will not sue each other. So several companies, they are in MPEG and they're also in the alliance. So Samsung, Cisco, Google, Microsoft, several of them are in both patent pools. So they will not fight over these patents. But some other companies, such as those ones that are here, they were not interested in joining the alliance. So we will see uh, probably a lot of uh, fighting over those patents. Uh, currently, we don't have extensive support. So for the newest chips for Samsung, they already support AV1 decoding. You, are, uh, you have support in some TVs, especially for 8K. This is, of course, interesting. But other companies such as Apple, they don't support it yet. Even though they say they will, they have not done it yet. So it's something very new for AV1, and we will see what's going to happen. So here we have the latest picture for the mess of the HEVC, now including these patents that um, those companies claim that have been infringed. So those are the patents from the HEVC that those companies say uh, they are also related with what AV1 did, right? So this is the current situation for all of those technologies. But this is not enough. There is more competition, internal competition at MPEG, right? So this uh, is something very interesting that happened. As I said, for instance, companies such as Samsung, that they were not so much interested. They were interested in BBC, but they are also interested in something else. So when the uh, call for proposals for the VVC was done in 2018, these companies, they proposed a codec that would have a royalty-free baseline profile. So if you have just a basic codec, you don't pay. They ensure this is not infringing any patents because we're just using technology that is uh, patent by a patents that have been already expired. And if you want something else, then you have some switchable enhancements. Then you just pay for the enhancements and they would say exactly how much you would have to pay. So this um, it has been promoted a lot. It's called the EVC. It was then finalized last year. It's 25% uh, less than HEVC, similar to AV1, hopefully half of the complexity of VVC. And uh, they claim that they will say what is the, the license terms by next year. So this code that has been considered for many other standards. And the last one is the LCEVC. So this one has been also considered, also finalized last year. And this is actually what we call a codec agnostic tool. This, it means that you can use any codec as a basis, even if you want, or H.264, whatever you want. They just propose it this base base stream and enhancement bit stream so they have this idea of scalability and they have actually already announced what are the license fees so people are already paying attention to this code so um i i wanted to show you all of those options and to talk about all of these patterns because we discussed at the beginning uh what are why are the reasons why so many technologies are not adopted or not and here you can see clearly that it's not because of the technical aspect of it. Actually, the AVC got an Emmy Award. And this picture is so nice. Here you can see um, 
the people that are here are the, the real researchers and developers. So here you see that have been working on this for like 30 years. You see people from Intel, Samsung, Microsoft, Ericsson, Qualcomm, uh, from Hofer. You see that the, those are real, the people are, are, that I talked about that wrote the papers and they got the Emmy for the technology. So the EVC was a huge, a very nice technology, good technology, very nice quality, even though it was not able to be adopted as it was expected because of this problem with the patent pools, right? And here you also have the JPEG. JPEG also got an Emmy. Actually, most of those technologies have been awarded and uh, even though not all of them have been adopted. And so this is the current situation. We are here in 2021, almost 20 years later, and this is the adoption of H264, huge. This is a, a, a search for last year, um, and they asked companies what they were planning to adopt for the next year. So they said, okay, we are planning to adopt AV1 and even HEVC, but even though H2, um, HEVC is still the dominant technology. And uh, the reason is, of course, the lack of proper patent, patent pools, but also because uh, these new technologies, they are more uh, beneficial, for instance, for high resolution content for 8K. And 8K, it's not believed to be uh, soon for everybody. And also because people are consuming a lot of video on smartphones. So for smartphones, you don't need to go to, the, to those higher um, resolutions. And HEVC is just good enough, right? So this is the situation so far. But what is expected is that with 5G, we will finally have all of those immersive scenarios devices everything else and h264 is not able to support it so the industry expects that this scenario will change soon with the arrival of those immersive content right so uh before we finish i want to talk about the brazilian participation this is really nice as i said we started to be able to collaborate with our proposals in 2018, and we have been able to contribute mostly in these three uh, standards, MMT, JPEG Clean, and PCC. Uh, we just have one company participating, Samsung, and two university groups that are here. And we were able to see that uh, that is not uh, it, it's not a lack of interest or competence. It's really a lack of money. So we must have more companies, especially private investments. Um, this, uh, if we are able to do this, we know that we will be able to increase a lot Brazilian participation. And this is important because if you look at uh, Netflix numbers, for instance, currently uh, Brazilians are like number two in the world. So we are huge customers of this type of media, we must be able to produce these standards as well, not only to use them, you know, and to produce them in a way that's beneficial for us, according to the country interests. So now we are able to do this, as I said, very small, very small participation yet, but hopefully it will increase. So I will talk mostly now about these two standards because we haven't discussed them. They are very related with this immersive world, and those are the standards that we are participating and that we have participated in the past. So here is the JPEG family of standards. I just said previously, right? JPEG is not just one standard. Look how many others. And this is the JPEG Plino. Plino comes from Plenoptic because this is standard. It was designed to be actually a framework for these three, three types of formats, point clouds, light fields, and holography, right? So we were able to contribute on the uh, compression of light field images, which was the first activity. And uh, we collaborated a lot. There was a lot of work done by Brazilians in all the parts of the standard, especially in those uh, parts that I have highlighted here. So we were responsible for the conformance testing, for the reference software. We did a lot of work with the part two um, in specifying uh, one way of compressing this type of technology. So I would say this is so far the standard that has um, that we were able to really participate. And it was uh, finalized last year. We still don't have devices that can take pictures with light fields, but hopefully when we have them, uh, we will be able, people will be able to use this standard. And uh, you will know that has been 
made with a huge contribution of Brazilians. And the other standard is the DPCC. It's related with point cloud compression. And uh, here we just arrived at in the end. So we know that they have been working since in 2014. And uh, in 2017, they issued the call for proposals. And so when we arrived at here, uh, in the end, we were able to make a very small contribution, but still was very, very interesting. We were able to learn what it is. And the PCC is actually divided in two different codecs. One is called the video-based VPCC, and the other is the geometry-based GPCC. And it depends on the type of point clouds. Uh, it's sparse or dense or the application. Um, the compression that it's, it can be achieved right now, it's already impressive, 100 times to 300 times. And uh, this is how it is encoded. So the 3D point clouds, they are actually encoded as a set of 2D, 2D videos. Uh, so there is this projection phase. And um, that's why you can actually use any codec that you want inside of it. So you can apply HVC, AVC, or even VVC, or EVC, any codec that you want. So. Um, this, as a, this, code, this standard, as I said, has been finalized last year. So there is a lot of um, expectation for its adoption soon. It can, of course, provide several immersive experiences, six of um, everything. And we were able to do to start our contributions in October last year. And several Brazilians have been working uh, even today and making contributions for other areas of the PCC not only the VPCC, but also the GPCC. And I also wanted to show this picture because when we talk about a standard, we discuss VP, VPCC, VVC, uh, a standard is not only, uh, is, when we talk about video, it, it's never alone. It's also part of a bigger standard. So for instance, in 2018 and even before the MPEG came up with this idea of the MPEG immersive standard, and they decided to have all of those parts. So if you look at the parts, and this is always how the standard is done, you are going to see the VVC is here. So VVC is actually a standard inside of the immersive standard. So you're going to see the audio coding, immersive audio coding, point clouds compression. You're going to see other technologies for supporting the streaming formats, everything else. So that was the plan in 2018. PCC is here, and this is how it looks today. So you saw that from 2018, the standard had eight parts. Today, the standard has 26. So most of those parts are uh, related to reference software conformance testing, but there were some uh, changes, important changes. So one of them is that uh, the MPEG immersive video codec was introduced. This is very nice, so much related with dense light fields and other technologies like that to provide 6 DOF. Uh, and then because of that, uh, the VPCC was actually, um, it became something bigger that was called the V3C, the Visual Volumetric Video Based Coding. And now the VPCC is a small part of it, not a small, but just a subset of it. And the GPCC is also included here. So now we have this biggest, when you when you learn about this, talk about this, we have this bigger codex called V3C. VPCC is a part of it, as well as MIV. All of them related with immersive encoding and technologies like that. And so uh, just before the end of the talk, I wanted to show you what's going on in our Brazilian forum for uh, the digital uh, TV system. So I'm not sure if you know, but uh, the discussions for the TV 3.0 have already started and uh, they are actually requiring support for immersive content. So VR, AR, XR, 6 DOS, 3 DOS, it's there for our next TV standard and also a scalable video. So they have launched the call for proposals. They have received the responses already for uh, from 21 different organizations. And I have highlighted here uh, the uh, codex that have been proposed for all of those systems, the ones that are related to our talk today. So for instance, MMT has been proposed for the video coding HEVC, LCVC, VVC, and for the VR coded, the VPCC. 
So what's nice here is that for uh, the previous uh, Brazilian digital TV system, for instance, uh, we were not producers of any of those codecs. We're just selecting. So now we are, now we are selecting, but we are also part of them. So of course, very small part of them yet, but uh, it's very nice to know that this technology they are on the table. And right now what they are doing is that they are testing and evaluating all of those technologies. And this has been done by seven different Brazilian universities that are here. Each one's responsible for one uh, component, system component. Of course, we have more than video coding, etc. And if everything goes fine, we should have this new uh, digital TV uh, Brazilian system operating uh, from 2023. So um, I wanted to show these last two slides here. And uh, the reason is why when uh, we started the talk, uh, we were saying what goes on in the industry, what's happening, what's going on, what, what's going to be the adoption for this immersive world. And um, we saw that there are so many things involved in communication, the standards and patents, not only devices and content, but this roadmap is um, uh, something that I believe it's very useful and uh, has been done by MPEG for so many years. So this is the roadmap that I saw when I joined MPEG back in 2018. And you can see that some things were already here. For instance, here you have the new video codec. Uh, didn't have a name yet. This now is the VVC. So everything that they had planned here, light field coding, PCC was already here, 6DOF application format, a genome compression, 6DOF audio coding. So if you, if you had access to this roadmap back there, you would see, for instance, that we would not have any device related with point cloud before 2021 because the standard would not be ready yet. Of course, 5G is also related, but this is the plan that the industry follows, right? So this is very valuable information for everybody that's trying to predict the future. Of course, I'm not saying that everything that's here really happens. I'm just saying that uh, several companies and really several, you saw the names, they got together every year, every meeting to try to come up with this roadmap and try to have an agreement. And uh, there are several meetings that are called requirements where people try to define what we will use, what we will happen, how, uh, what are the interests that will be the strongest. So as I said, this was the roadmap from when I joined it. And this is the roadmap from today. I got this from the last meeting. And as you can see here, most of the codecs we talked about are here. EVC, LCEVC, the MIV, you can see that here people were talking about AI-based video coding. You can see that you have so many other things going on. Video coding for machines, this one, for instance, is super interesting. So what happens if the user, it's not a human, it's a machine. So what are the quality metrics? What are the bit rates? So there are so many applications today that uh, are done for uh, machines, not real users in the end. So this is included here. Haptics is here. Um, genome compression is here. So if you take a look at it, I think it's, again, very valuable information for those who are trying to figure out what to do and what's going to happen and what are the years here that uh, companies are considering. So um, I invite you all again to join the committee to join uh, our delegation so you will have access to this information and others. And I actually added one last slide this morning because I saw this email this morning. And this is the invitation for a workshop that has been organized by JPEG and MPEG Emerging Activities. And uh, it's going to be next week. And so look, uh, look at the topics. I think they are very interesting for this community. AI-based coding. So neural network video coding, video coding for machines, point cloud coding, uh, JPEG Plano, uh, mesh coding. It's also a new topic. Light field coding. So uh, it's going to be given the talk by a Brazilian, Professor Eduardo from Federal University of Rio, which is a big, has became a big contributor for JPEG. MPEG lenslet video coding. 
So for people that are working in this field, I believe that um, having the chance of participating in a workshop like this, for instance, it's uh, very interesting. Very valuable information is usually shared in these workshops, okay? So I will finish with this slide and um, uh, I would like to thank the invitation again and um, also congratulate all the organizers for such great event. And here is my contact if you want to know more about the delegation, about standards or anything else, just get in touch. Thank you all. Thanks, uh, Vanessa. It was really, really nice talk. Um, uh, it was really mind blowing for me as you bring so many uh, information, not only technical information, but also the backstage of uh, what's happening exactly. in, this kind of, in this kind of industry. So it's um, thanks very much. Um, it was really enlightening for me. I have many questions. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it'll be more a discussion. So I, I, would, uh, I will um, first encourage people to uh, ask questions on, on our um, YouTube chat. But and I'll start with one question here. We also have Emilio and I can ask questions if he wants. Uh, but but my first question would be, why um, why do you why there is this uh, huge amount of patents related to a single codec? But from my point of view, of course, uh, I would say I, I guessed one thousand patents. <laughs> but then, um, how do people do that? Because if it's uh, you design some some codec, then um, is it possible to change just a part of it and it becomes a, a patent? How does it work? Yes, um, this is an interesting question because we uh, had one thousand patents, but for each of you saw seventeen thousand patents, yeah. right? And uh, so first, you have to keep in mind that there are so many companies, fifty companies, working on this. And that when you look at the blocks, the diagram, it, it doesn't really show all the complexity of the codex. So, for instance, when you just talk about the transform, there are so many ways to do it. Or the prediction, the interprediction, the interprediction. So there are so, so, so many things that are uh, proposed. And um, it's also interesting to talk about how it is done. We didn't talk about this, but it's interesting, I think. So when you go, so let's say you are working with your team in the insert prediction. So you have some proposals, right? And you go to the meeting. You actually have to present your results in a very fixed way. So you have to present your results in this specific metric, in this data set, and the other companies will check your results. So we have what's called cross checker. So when you are at the meeting, the decisions are made a base based on the metrics so objective metrics subjective metrics then let's say they came to the conclusion that your technology is better than the others so your technology will be included in the standard right and the others will not at that specific part of it uh, so uh, this is what is done in the meetings and you have to keep in mind that this process takes like five years so people go to the meetings four times per year, but after when they came back to the companies, the development continues. So you have teams of like 100 people working at each one of those companies. And then you have like 10 people who really attend the meeting. Those people that you saw in the room at 10 p.m. at night. And then when the codec is ready, when we are at the meetings, people don't talk about patents. There is no patent discussion. Nobody talks about it. When the codec is done, then the lawyers from those companies, they get together the patents. And then they say, okay, those are the essential patents from my company. I want to charge X for those companies. And then the lawyers try to get together with these other companies to build these patent pools and to figure out how they will charge for the riots and everything else with the patent today. So this is actually a very frustrating process for the experts, for the developers, for people that are working on the development of the codec. Because they work like five years, they got an Emmy for the codec, and then in the end, it's not you can't use the codec because the companies, the lawyers, were not able to achieve an agreement. 
So yeah. this is something that has been criticized for many years at MPEG. And then you saw when I mentioned EVC, for instance, uh, which is a totally new approach. It's like, okay, we will start from the beginning to talk about patents. So we will say from the beginning, we are proposing this uh, baseline that's royalty free. We know that there are no patents. And then we have this enhancement um, profile. Then we have patents. And this is how we will license the patents. So uh, this is how in the end you have so many related patents. Don't forget that many of them are legacy right, from 30 years before. And if you look at the uh, development of the codex, if you look at the, uh, how, how is the, the block diagram for the HEDC, for the EDC, you will see what are all of those technologies. So if, uh, for people that are really interested on this, uh, because VVC is a new codex, uh, in our conferences, people are always giving talks about VVC um, uh, explanation. So for, for people who are interested, I really recommend it and you will be able to see how much work can fit in that code. It's really impressive. Cool, yeah, yeah, I had no idea. And I, I, I heard about, for example, AV1, which was uh, intended to be like more, um, uh, I, I remember uh, Mozilla was involved with it some, for some yeah. reason because they, uh, they are, uh, they are a company that's interested in having open source uh, stuff. So yeah, and uh, and it's interesting to hear that the the difficulties that we that that people may have when trying to implement such royalty free um, codex. Yeah, uh, I have one comment here from uh, from Gastal. Uh, it was also one of my questions. Do you think those codecs may really benefit from machine learning approaches or that those would... They have already been benefited. So um, even at this uh, CV graph, we do have a paper, Samsung, together with UND, about uh, applying machine learning for an end-to-end -end, uh, codec. And uh, what we have seen already are some blocks of it. So for instance, the future, the prediction, where people are already applying machine learning techniques, but we don't have yet at MPEG, for instance, a code that, that uh, it's end to end uh, done, so, you know, machine learning. What we have is that, uh, is that inside of some of the blocks, people are applying it. And if you think about it, um, compression has a lot to do with prediction, which is very related with machine learning. So uh, what is also interesting is that uh, for all of those codecs, we never, we don't have recognition, right? So uh, you are not encoding any specific content, even though we have classes. We classify the content such as, oh, this is a, a you know, high uh, movement. This is a game. And this is, I know, I don't know the news. So this is uh, the nature. So it changes a lot, uh, or this is a cartoon. So it changes a lot the performance of the codec, but you never really recognizes what is there. And uh, I know this is very different from what people from the machine learning area are used to do. Uh, but the reason is because you can't have a codec that uh, works just for this type of, I don't know, content where people are there. So you must have a, a codec that's able to be applied for any type of content. So Netflix is gonna apply it for all the videos that they have, and it's gonna, you know, uh, send the videos to the consumers. And they just change the resolution. They change lots of things uh, depending on your bandwidth. So there are many things to try to improve the quality of your video streaming, but there is no content recognition. Mm -hmm. So uh, machine learning is applied for. Uh, prediction is applied for better. So, so this is also very important. We have uh, quality metrics now that are using machine learning techniques to try to improve it, uh, especially from the subjective point of view, which is many times different from the objective metrics that we have. And so uh, you saw, I show it in the roadmap, this activity AI video coding and uh, this is something, but there is also AI applied in other parts of it. So video coding for machines, they are applying AI. 
uh, several others. So there is no doubt that machine learning is going to be important for compression. And does, does it uh, overcome or reduce the patent problem? Or it's just... <laughs> That's a good question. I don't think people got there yet. But uh, I really doubt it. I think that the patents will be there. Yeah, so there you go, uh, Gaston. <laughs> All right. So, Emilio, do, do you have any questions? Yeah, I will get one from the audience that uh, Iago asked about the... Uh, it was specific about who have uh, academic experience with uh, uh, Codex and how the companies see that, how the companies willing to hire someone with only academic background. But I can say that would be a general question. Suppose you have a very good PhD student or that give his academic on a very specific area like Codex, how the big companies see the this kind of professional and okay. how could be the process to hire someone like this background. So the short answer is great. It's uh, just for you to have an idea. 100% of my team has a PhD. And uh, so I can talk from the Samsung point of view. Of course, I can't talk um, for all the companies in Brazil. But what I see outside, so let's talk about this, outside of Brazil is that PhDs, especially when we talk about this work, the codex work, those people that were there, uh, you know, proposing things, I would say, I don't know, 80%, 90% of them had PhDs. So, uh, and uh, one of the reasons is because this type of knowledge, it's not, you don't learn it in the, um, in the undergrad studies. So usually, uh, even in the universities, not only here in Brazil, but also outside, uh, you are going to learn this type of stuff in the master, in the PhD. So this is something that requires a lot of uh, learning and effort. So, so what I see is that in this area, there are many, many PhDs in the industry and also here in Brazil. But here in Brazil, uh, talking about Samsung again, I see that uh, PhDs are, are very welcome, not only in my team, but also in the other teams. So uh, in, the, in the AI team, for instance, and it's really tough to find people in this field right now. Uh, of course, it's a super hot area and uh, Samsung is even hiding undergrad students right now and, you know, training them because it's, it's really, really hot. So uh, I don't know if it is because, uh, for instance, I had a PhD. So people who had PhDs, of course, they see it in a different way because sometimes people believe that PhD, you know, just study for five years. And actually, it's not. Actually, you are building something new in the world, and uh, your work is going to be very much related to the work in the industry later, right? So you will have to, to prepare talks, you will have to prepare proposals, you will have to present your um, ideas, you will have to present your ideas in an organized way. So uh, the PhD will give you so many more skills. It's not just learning about some technical stuff. It's not just study. Right. So people that are in the PhD here, they know about this and the people that are in the industry uh, know that as well. So, uh, of course, as I said, this is my point of view, what I see at Samsung and other companies in this area. I'm not sure it's the, not not the position of everybody, of course, but I would say very, very welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Vanessa. For that. Fantastic. Thank you. But um, we don't have yeah. many positions, right? Yet. So, yeah. so this true. is a very big problem. As I said, we have very, very few companies in Brazil investing on this and, and less and less. So the situation is really bad. Yeah. So uh, it's welcome, but uh, we are not really in the position of really developing uh, super innovative technology. Most of the companies in Brazil right now. It's very tough to find this type of work here, this type of position of possibility. But when I give talks to students, what I say is that uh, you don't have to look for the Brazilian market. For this type of knowledge, you have to look at the world. So uh, what you learn here uh, in the universities that we learn here, it's going to be good enough for working anywhere 
in the world. So this is what they have to keep in mind. So if you are looking for a PhD, go for it and uh, don't be restricted to the Brazilian market. This is not how you should look at it. Great. Uh, uh, from the point of view for IBM research, the same. And we have here a research lab as well then. Yes, that, that's a, a, a huge problem. And I agree with exactly what you said. That it's important to have PhD for some positions. It's hard to find the right, but it, normally the Brazilian uh, universities are really good and we can go for the world. Thank you, Vanessa. Good. Uh, I have just a, a, a last question. Uh, um, I was curious about why uh, there is a genome compression in the same pool as multimedia content. Yeah. So if, if you take a look at how they were talking about these requirements in the last years, they, they were saying um, compression is something that's required not only for multimedia, but there are so many other areas in the world that also require compression. And then genome is one of them. So they started this group and then they actually, um, now the scope of the MPEG or the SC29 as it's called right now, it's not only uh, multimedia, it's data in general. So it's called data compression. So it's audio, video, images, genome, it's anything else. Uh, they had an, one activity for something related with the industry, for instance. So any type of data that needs to be compressed, stored, um, sent, that must have uh, international standard, for instance, is welcome right now. And actually, this just genome activity has been ongoing for several years. It's not even something new. If you look for the roadmap in 2018, it was already there. Yeah, I was surprised. To, to yeah. Learn. All right, let's see if we have any other questions from, from the audience. Uh, well, many people congratulating you for your talk. Thank you. Emilio, do you have any, any other questions? Several, but I believe I can do it at offline because we are on top of the hour. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm very curious for other point, but I will send an email to Vanessa. I think. And that's very good. So, Vanessa, thanks very much for your talk, for your, uh, for having the uh, taking a few, uh, little bit of her time to being with us. Uh, I, I already I do admire your work and your career. And I think after this uh, contact, more uh, close contact, I became a kind of a fan. So thanks oh, very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, don't say that. I really appreciate it. And I'm very sad now. But uh, when, as I said, when I thought about this talk, I said, I need to prepare something that's first interesting for everybody and something new, something new that I know that people usually don't have access to this information the same way that I didn't have before I started. So I believe that starting the delegation was great. Uh, being able to contribute as the head of the Brazilian delegation has also been great. And I really hope that this can help the Brazilian community as a whole. You see, I see this as a big potential for the future of everybody, professors, the industry, the students, everybody that's interested. So hope to see you there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, I think you can wrap up. Bye bye. Any any bye. final words, Emilio? No. So no, just, just thank you. And, and second, what you said that it's uh, amazing work and was amazing uh, uh, talk. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, so now we have a, um, a break, and then uh, afterwards we are going to have a paper presentation and another talk that will be really interesting. So stick with us.
Hello and uh, welcome back to our workshop of industry applications at CBGRAPI 2021. I'm um, here with Emilio Vital Brasil, which is my co-chair at this workshop. And for the next part, we are going to have a paper presentation. Emilio, do you do, can you do the, the honors? Sure. Uh, we have the the paper that was accepted was uh, the comparative study of method, methods based on deep neural network for self-reading of energy consumption in a chatbot application context. Uh, today, the uh, uh, Italy will present the Italy will present the paper, and first we will see a 10 minute video then then we have five minutes to questions okay please we can play the video hi my name is italo francis and i'm going to present this work entitled a comparative study of methods based on deep neural networks for self-reading of energy consumption in a chatbot application context this work was developed in an r d project involving Equatorial Energy Group and Federal University of Maranhão. This presentation will cover the following topics. Introduction, application scenario, proposed method, dataset, experiment details, results, conclusion and future works. The Equatorial Energy Group's electric utilities measure the energy consumption with the help of the meter readers, they are the employees responsible for collecting energy consumption information of consumers. This procedure is called reading process and has two main problems. The reading process is manually performed and susceptible to errors and exposure to different weather conditions for long hours of the day can cause fatigue and health problems in readers. So there are two possible solutions for those problems. The first of them is the use of smart meters. However, this solution has a high financial cost and demands an impracticable implementation time because there are many meters to be replaced. On the other hand, self-reading is a more viable solution and is encouraged by the Brazilian Electricity Regulatory Agency. Self-reading comprises the use of digital platforms, example mobile applications, through which the consumer performs the reading of his energy consumption. The Equatorial Energy Group has a chatbot application integrated with WhatsApp through which some services are offered. This encourages the development of a self-read service to be integrated with this application. So, to make available this solution to the public, it is important to consider two main factors, response time and accuracy, so that the automatic reading process needs to obtain accurate results in a short time. So, the main objective of this work is a comparative study between image recognition methods in the context of self-reading as a service to be incorporated into chatbot solution. This work is based on a previous study done by Roche et al. However, in the present work, limitations of that are identified and analyzed. In addition, improvements are proposed. The application scenario of this chatbot solution can be seen in Figure 1. The consumer starts a conversation with the chatbot using the messaging application. To perform self-reading, the chatbot requires to the consumer to send an image of his meter. This image will be sent to the inference server responsible for running the proposed method for automatic reading process. Lastly, the inference server will send a response containing the reading value that will be presented to the consumer. The steps of the proposed method can be seen in Figure 2. Uh, the initial detection is the first step in which will occur the detection of meter, display and digits. The detected digits will be passed to the second step called reading recognition in which that, uh, those digits will be recognized from 0 to 9. 
in Rush at all. Our previous work, the initial detection, comprises the use of two retina nets, networks for meter and display detection. So each neural network was trained to identify a specific type of meter, analogical or digital, and digit. The retina net that obtains the highest confidence for detections will define which process will be performed. In addition, two retina nets are used for digit detection, so a model is chosen based on the previous detection. For the reading recognition step, an ensemble of classifiers SVM, XGBoost and Efficient Net is used. In this work, for the initial detection step, we use a single CNN to process meter images regardless of their type, analogic or digital. In this case, we use a one-shot approach. So, objects of interest should be the meter, displays and digits types 1 and 2. For this step, we analyze two approaches, scale the OV4 and efficient that the one replacing retina nets. And for the reading recognition step, replacing the ensemble, we use efficient net B2. The dataset used in our experiments was provided by Equatorial Energy Group and contains images of analogical and digital meters with their respective annotations, such as meter, display, digital type 1 and digital type 2, as can be seen in figure 4. In the experiments, stress testing were implemented by using Locus library. A simulation of multiple requests to the inference set was performed. In that context, each request represents a user access from two users to 1024 users. For evaluation of the network performances, we use mean average precision MAP and accuracy per reading sequences. The split rates of the dataset were 70% for training and 30% for testing. All the convolutional networks were implemented by using Curious and TensorFlow. Table 1 shows the results obtained for the response times in stress tests. The studied approaches Efficient Net D1 and Scale D4 obtained better response times that proposed than that proposed by Roche et al. our previous work. It proves that the use of a single CNN implies a reduction in response time, as can be seen in Table 1. A comparative analysis of response times can be seen in Figure 5. From 64 users, the differences between response times become more evident. The approaches, the approaches studied in this work overcome that proposed by Rocha Tal of a previous work. In Table 2, MP results obtained by each tested approach for initial detection can be seen. Regarding MEP, our previous work reached the best results. It was expected because that method uses networks trained specifically for each component. Despite MEP has been degraded in cases of efficient net G1 and scale G over 4, it is kept at satisfactory levels. At last, regarding accuracy. The combination of scale GL V4 and efficient net B2 obtains the best result surpassing the others, including our previous work. So we can conclude the following points. Scale GL V4 combined with efficient net B2 obtained values equivalent to our previous work. It's possible to reduce the response time without degrading the accuracy that's confirming the main hypothesis of this study. Among the analyzed approaches, scale GL V4 combined with efficient net B2 is a promise alternative to be incorporated into the inference 7.
in the context of our chatbot solution. As future works, it is intended to continue the study aiming to improve the accuracy of reading recognition. Tests will be carried out with other efficient net models, B and L families, and also networks based on visual transformers. It is intended to incorporate into the chatbot solution a method for recognizing the identification codes of the meters as an additional step to ensure more security for the reading process. Thank you very much. If you have any question, please contact us. Thank you, Italo. Nice. Great talk. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, let me see if there's any question from the audience first. Okay, not yet. Let me start with one. <laughs> uh, your accuracy was about 60%. And uh, uh, in the end, that's, I'm not sure if it's useful or not for the, the, the final uh, uh, application. I want to understand first if it's was for production or if it's useful because uh, depends on the application that could be something useful or not i want to understand for the application that you are trying it's good enough or you need to improve the accuracy and if it's you need to improve how much to be acceptable for the application okay thanks for the question uh, well the accuracy value is good enough, but uh, we need to consider some points. Uh, this accuracy value pointed in at the paper and at and the presentation uh, consider the whole reading sequence. If we disconsider uh, one or two digits, this accuracy uh, increases. So, uh, this value is good, but we need to improve. So we 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 are studying uh, other approaches, uh, searching for this search for improvements for this accuracy value, and a minimum uh, we in in studies and some some conversations uh, we we believe a minimum point is around 65 uh, percent approximately 65 percent around but as i said 60 percent is the value we reached in this work but if we this consider some numbers, this value increases. And we are studying now how to to deal with these misclassifications of some digits. Yeah, um, I would like to ask another question about the uh, if this type of application is, uh, do you know if there is a possibility of human verification? Because for, uh, uh, as, as far as I know, there is, uh, of course, you want to automate some part of the system, but in, in some scenarios in, in practice, what companies do is they uh, they uh, will will try to read it automatically or to find, detect something automatically from, from vision for images. And, and then if it's not possible, for example, if the classifier outputs a low probability, then it goes for a human to verify it. Do you think this is a possibility, or did you discuss this with the with the company? Okay. Uh, when the inference server uh, responds with the value of reading, uh, this value is presented to the consumer, and the consumer can change can correct if the reading value is incorrect. Uh, this number, th this reading value, so is sent is sent to the to the company, and there uh, uh, this value will be analyzed, and it 
and this value will be uh, compared in a, each each consumer has a minimum expected value for reading and a maximum expected value for reading. So the reading value will be analyzed and compared if this this value is in that uh, interval mm -hmm. in this range. Yes. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Italo. Uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Hey, sorry, Daphne, I was uh, yeah. Oh. Sorry, I was talking in mute. This right. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this is a question about training. Uh, I believe it's about training because they are asking about the distortion and rotation. Probably, if you try to distort and rotate your training set as a, a, a pre-processing to create more samples, did you yes. try that? And how was yes, the result? Uh, yes, uh, the data set provided by Equatorial Energy Group. Uh, comprised of images uh, taken in different meter positions. So there are meters that are rotated uh, and uh, some meters has a, a box for protecting. And this box can, can be uh, injured. So Yes, we have a, a lot of samples with different uh, conditions of rotation. Uh, some some samples uh, are next to the camera. Other samples are far the camera. So we we have a, a data set with different different image conditions. Great, thank you. Uh, Mosi, if you have another question, yeah. or we can go through. No, um, I think we can wrap up. Thanks, Italo, for the talk and for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. And... okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much. We can move on to the next, um, to our next invited talk. So I'll let Emilio do the honors of uh, presenting myself. It's a, a, a great uh, uh, pleasure to have Marcelo talk for us today. Marcelo Sikura, it's a, a friend that, uh, that I met in IMPA many years ago. I don't say how many to, because that could be compromising, but uh, uh, I have the pleasure to work with Marcelo in different occasions. We don't have any paper together, but we for sure discuss very good ideas and he influenced my work many times uh, and I'm very uh, uh, thankful for that. And today Marcelo will talk about one work that he's, uh, 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 it's interesting because he's bringing a different trend for the industry that normally is not easy to see here in Brazil, that's about CAD and uh, uh, Marcelo is working online technology, and he will be talking about from trimmed nerves to watertight boundaries representation of CAD models. Marcelo, please, I'm anxious for your talk. Thank you, Emilio. Let me share my screen. Um, that's one second. So good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to uh, contribute to, uh, to CBGRAP in some capacity. And I uh, wish I, I, I would be physically present with all of you in an auditorium, but since this is not possible, maybe in some other occasion, we do what we can right now. So before I start, let me thank uh, Moacy and Emilio for this invitation, and also um, uh, the audience for attending the talk. I also would like to say that I tried to come up with a very general talk 
it's not too technical so that I hope that it can be um, accessible to a large audience in, in graphics, uh, vision, uh, and image processing. And uh, if you have any questions that are more technical, or if you want to go in, 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 in some kind of in-depth discussion, please use my Gmail account that is in this first slide uh, to get in touch with me. It would be a pleasure to discuss this topic uh, further with uh, 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 anyone. Um, so I will talk today about a problem that I sort of knew when I was in academia, but uh, when I moved to industry uh, in my very first job in a startup uh, for 3D printing. This problem became a kind of a, a reality. Like uh, I actually could see something that I only heard of at the time. And, and I was really impressed by how important it was uh, for the CAD community. And uh, I'm more impressed now why uh, with the fact that the problem became a little bit more important due to, to some consequences and some advance of, of new technology like 3D printing and also uh, to also technology related to um, simulation. So I hope uh, that uh, I would be able to convey the importance of the problem to all of you and discuss a little bit um, the shortcomings of the, the the current solutions uh, that we can find in the literature from an industry perspective. Um, before I start, I would like to dedicate this talk to um, two professors that you, you probably know well, uh, the Brazilian community. Uh, they are uh, Maria Cristina Ferreira de Oliveira from USP and Antonio Castelo Filho from USP as well who introduced me to the topic of geometric modeling. modeling uh, I noticed today, like basically 30 years ago. So, uh, and, and it's, a, it's still a topic that fascinates uh, me uh, to this date. So I will start this talk by giving some background to understand the problem I will introduce, which is called the gap problem. And then I will just take a closer look at the problem and try to explain its root cause. After that, we will see uh, what we have as solutions in the literature. And I will try to give a kind of critical um, look uh, at those solutions, just to give you an idea of why they would not work uh, in, in the kind of data that I, I work with. In, in, in the company uh, and a few years ago. And then I will end the talk with some remarks that, that are related to what I would expect uh, from, uh, from some solution that would be applied to uh, the cases that I saw in practice. So um, to start with, uh, as I told you before, I'm not going to uh, be very, very technical here. So let's consider that uh, a CAD model is basically a geometric model of a solid object. For instance, of a mechanical part like the one that you see in this slide. And here we will also consider that we are representing this model in a computer by considering the boundary of the object only, which is a too manifold since we are dealing with a solid. And this too manifold may have more than one connected component. In the CAD world, we call this, those surfaces uh, the, that, that uh, make up the boundary of, of a solid of shells. Although mathematically speaking, I, I'm much more comfortable saying, saying surfaces or too many folds. Right? And uh, it's interesting that every possible uh, shell or surface, it's, it's actually, it, it consists of a collection of surface patches that we, that we can call faces that are put together in such a way that they glue along their common boundary edges 
Uh, and in this slide, you, I just highlighted one of them. So it's like a puzzle that you're putting pieces together in some, in some way, like if you are doing a mesh, but a curved mesh, and those, uh, those uh, uh, pieces are called uh, surface patches of faces. Geometrically speaking, uh, those faces are actually defined by what we learn in, in computer graphics courses. Uh, uh, they are basically defined by uh, no uniform rational B spline uh, surfaces. So it's basically a parametrization of a rectangular domain that we see in the plane, right? Taken to space by a rational polynomial function. So, but the name trimmed comes due to the fact that in practice we are not taking the usually we are not taking the entire rectangular domain to space but we are taking some region that we trimmed with some curves that we define in the domain that we call trimming curves those curves are also rational bispline curves and what you what we have in space is is just a piece of this rectangle. Uh, in, in some cases, obviously, I mean, the, the entire rectangle can go uh, and, and become a face, but this is a rare case in practice. So if I zoom in, uh, in this screw that you see uh, it, it, it highlighted here, that piece that I showed in the previous slide is exactly what you see here. Right, so I'm taking that that trimmed piece by this parametrization. That piece is is what we saw before. Okay, so this is how those faces are actually represented internally in 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 a computer when we deal with CAD models. And it's possible that the boundary of of a face, I mean the bounding edges, they actually have, uh, they actually form uh, more than one loop of edges. For instance, in this case, we would take the, as, as the region, uh, the, 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 the region of the plane that, are, that is in between the two uh, the circles that you see here. So uh, what I mean is that the, the boundary of the face can actually consist of more than one connected component of, 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 of more than one loop of, of curves. So what, what we mean by gaps, right? Um, it, it, it's very interesting that what we see, it's not what you get, right? Uh, in, in the following sense, when you look at the rendering of, of a CAD model in some kind of tool, like this GUI that I'm using here, and if you zoom in some pieces, right, like I'm doing, you look and you see that everything seems to be good, right? Um, it, it looks like uh, you have a watertight surface, but internally, unfortunately, those curves do not glue uh, in the way that you would expect. In general, there is a mismatch in which that mate edges are not identical. And this is what uh, we mean by gaps or cracks in the surface, right? So th they are very, very small. In general, even the vertices are not, uh, are not the same as well, but obviously uh, visually you, you cannot detect, right? You need to actually uh, uh, see the, uh, the numbers in the code, control points of those curves and, and so on and so forth to identify uh, the failures. And so what we have internally is something like that. You would expect that edge one and edge two are actually the same as they should be, but they are not the same internally. And this is a, a big issue for the following reason. If you want to do something with this model and this something in the applications in general, we, we think about doing simulations, or actually even fabricating the model, somehow this becomes a huge problem. And it seems, and this is not an, an, a new problem. It, it has been out there for many, many years. And 
con also considered to be one of the most important uh, problems in, in the card world because it breaks this pipeline of interoperability between CAD software, CHI software, and TAN software. So, and more importantly, is that recently, this advent of this isogeometric analysis, which is a technique that can actually solve equations on surfaces without using volumetric meshes, became a reality lately, right? I mean, at least in, in more recent years, and they need actually a manifold to work with. And when we have those surfaces with cracks, we cannot do with, uh, deal with that. Uh, and then this becomes a huge problem. Usually what you see in Pratex is that people basically create a mesh out of the model, right? And, and on doing the mesh, you basically glue those uh, uh, those gaps. But of, obviously at this point, you are giving up a smooth representation and taking back a, uh, a piecewise linear one, which is not always the best, uh, uh, the best representation for all types of applications down. And, and, uh, when you go down this pipeline, especially for fabrication and, and simulation. So the importance of this problem is, is well known for, a, for many, many years. And, and it, it, what is fascinating is that how come up to this point, there was no good solution for it. And that's what I would like to discuss a little bit later. Right? right now, let's try to understand why the problem occurs, which is something that if you just consider what I showed before and what I said before, you can say, how can gaps occur? I mean, th those are just curves that you are, that somebody is probably placing there, right? Some design or something like that. But the truth is that it, it's not. It, it, it's a very interesting problem, even from a mathematical point of view. So to understand that, let's look at how trimming curves are defined. So let's pick up two patches that they share an edge in common let's say two pieces that you see uh, uh, in the rectangular uh, uh, domains right when they go to space it means that those two little uh, 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 curves they will become should become the same in space so but what happens is that those curves are defined in actually in the reverse order when models are defined, they are actually defined by Boolean operations. Designers, they use Boolean operations. They create shapes uh, by doing in union intersections differences in, in the solid modelers. And when you do that, those curves in space, the, the curves that you see on the top of the picture, they occur as being intersection of uh, two uh, surface patches, right? And then that's when we define uh, the curves that you see in the domain as the inverse process. So that's the way the curves uh, 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 arise. Now, that obviously doesn't explain why we have gaps, right? If they are, if it's an intersection curve, is the curve is the same. What's going on that we have two different ones in in, in the two adjacent adjacent patches. Well, this is just another view of this intersection, right? I mean, you're seeing two patches, the two patches that I had before. But the interesting thing is that, as I said, so they, they arise not because the designer placed them there. The designer basically uh, uses Boolean operations on, on some objects uh, 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 which are made out of, of those surface patches. And the intersections are the ones that give rise to the trimming curves, right? As, as intersections of surface with surface. Very well. The problem is the following, like right? this intersection curve, although we have two parametric surfaces, the intersection curve may not be parametric at all, right? It's, it's algebraic, but it might not have 
a parametric rational representation. So this is a, it is basically a mathematical impossibility. You are represent, we, we want to represent everything with rational uh, uh, polynomials, but that may not be possible anymore after we have those intersections, right? And even if we could, even if you consider that the two, the two, the, the, the intersection curve could have a parametric representation, it might actually have a degree that is not practical at all. So there is a very a, a classic paper that gives a very interesting uh, proof of of the fact that two bicubic surfaces uh, surface patches they can actually intersect on a curve that has degree 324. So this is not how uh, uh, solid modelers would, would want to work with. And what they do is indeed uh, what can be done. If you want to stick with uh, uh, the rational polynomial representation, and especially with low degree, all you can do is to approximate those intersections with low degree rational polynomial curves. Right? But the problem is that when you approximate, the curve is not exactly what is there. And what happens is that uh, we project those intersection curves back to the surfaces. And in each surface, the curve is obviously uh, slightly different, right? In, in each surface patch. And, and that's why gaps arise. So this is the very much the root cause of the problem. And the interesting thing is that the curves that we see in the domain, which are the 2D curves, the pre-images the pre of the 3D curves, they are actually defined from the intersection curves in space, not the other way around. So what we have in practice is this, right? We have intersections and from the intersection curves, we define what you see in the in the in the domain. Some algorithms obviously are already built uh, as the product uh, as the product of the intersection curve, the, the the two D curves. But in any case, this is an inverse problem. Now, what we have in the literature uh, for solving this this issue? Right? Well, in, in my humble opinion. This is by far the best work that I've seen in the literature, right? So Dinesh Manosha, uh, for uh, in a span of six years or so, he came up with a series of papers that proposed an exact representation for those intersection curves. Obviously, since a parametric representation, a rational parametric representation is not always possible, we need to use some other one. So what he did is that he converted one of the two patches that are intersecting to an implicit representation. And thanks to that, he actually was able to represent the intersection curve with an implicit representation as well. But at least it was exact, right? So up to numerical uh, issues, which we are not free of when we work with floating point arithmetic, right? You would have exactness. So, but to implement that, he also needed to use something that gives uh, some numerical guarantees and exact arithmetic was used at the time. And I, as I said before, I believe this is from a theoretical standpoint, it is the best solution that we have out there. And he, he even went far to implement a solid modeler as a prototype uh, to prove that all this theoretical background could actually be made practical. Unfortunately, and as I said before, uh, looking from an industry perspective, this would also mean that every possible uh, software company that has a geometric modeler would need to change the, the software uh, to use a different representation. But you can imagine that at this point, in, in, with a billion dollar industry, this is basically something that requires a, a, a huge investment. So unfortunately, at this point, uh, uh, I mean, the industry decided to stick with 
they had before, right? In other words, basically saying, okay, this is great, but we will not, we will not use it. But as far as I know, and, and for my own taste, this is a hell of a work. And if you are curious about this area, I would definitely recommend that you take a look at this work because uh, it shows a lot of beautiful results from the theoretical point of view, uh, algebraic geometry from a computational point of view, and also uh, uh, something that is, that is practical. Now, if we could not ex use exact representation, we can only approximate. So the other option that you can find in the literature is say, okay, let's, let's convert the trimmed patches into untrimmed ones. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I will look at those trimmed regions and try to approximate them with some other sort of, 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 of representation, right? And we have plenty of options for that. We can use subdivision surfaces. We can use triangular spline patches. We can use transfer product spline patches. And we can even use these splines, which is uh, the, the favorite uh, uh, choice for the IGA community. And I'll comment more on that. But again, there are lots of issues with those options. And I would like to go uh, and, and, and comment on each of them right now, right? So let, let's look at uh, uh, the most recent efforts just to showcase what people have been trying to do. So in this work, the idea was the following. You look at every possible treatment patch. So you, you see this picture below with these red lines, they delineate the trimmed patches of uh, a typical CAD model. This is the, the hood of a CAD, right? <laughs> so in this work, the author said the following, okay, let's mesh the, the trimmed region of the rectangular domains, and then let's approximate uh, every element of this mesh, which in this case was, uh, uh, we used, uh, they used the triangular elements, with triangular patches. Let's glue them together, approximate them uh, uh, where the, 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 the trimmed patches, they, they, they should be glued together. And because you are using triangular patches, you know, sewing, uh, the, uh, sewing them, it, it's actually pretty, pretty straightforward. You only need to care about continuity conditions at, at that, but then again, you know, you have, a huge amount of papers in the literature dealing in the literature dealing with the continuity issues. Uh, th this is an, an entire body of work that it's it's more difficult even to select an option because there are too many. Now, what I would like you to see here is that at, if you just look at the image on the left, on the top left you will see that you have lots of triangular patches, but the model itself initially only had a few trimmed, uh, uh, trimmed patches, right? So when you are using this kind of conversion and using this method, basically what you are doing is that you are replacing a few trimmed patches with lots of triangular patches that are very small. And there are more problems that I will discuss together when uh, we, we, we see the other efforts. Later, the authors uh, uh, improved upon this, this, this great solution just to give something that would be G1 continuous globally if by chance the surface doesn't have any sharp edges or something like that, right? So that, that was a focus on continuity, but this is hardly used for in practice. I mean, you just look at the highlight uh, uh, highlight lines, and I, I will also discuss that in the end. I don't, I don't want to touch in the shape quality issue right now. So the other option is, is stick with tensor product base line patches, right, instead of triangular patches. So this is the work that I consider to be probably the closest thing that could be used in practice. But 
there are a few issues as well. So first one, instead of using triangular patches, the authors decided to use rectangular patches, which is a very good idea, as I, as I will discuss pretty soon. But in the way they did it is that they also mesh each uh, uh, trimmed pet, patch individually. And they use an operation called composition to actually approximate the trimmed curves in the, in the parametric domain with curves instead of having a piecewise uh, a linear representation there. And when they take uh, the, the, the parametric domain to space, they use what we call a, a, a composition operator, which ends up raising the degree of the splines by a lot. So maybe if you start with a bicubic three by three by degree uh, uh, patch, you may end up with something that has degree 18, 18 to eight by 18. So, and not to mention that uh, they also dealt with the problem of having too many patches. So what you see on the left is an attempt to actually merge some of those quad patches that were identified initially, right? So when you look at the right, uh, the picture B and picture C are exactly the same model where uh, while the picture A is the original uh, trimmed model. And the idea is that they can reduce the number of patches uh, a little bit uh, compared to the initial number that they have. It's, it's already an attempt to reduce this number of patches compared to the, pre the previous paper that we saw. Now, it's also possible to use subdivision surfaces, right? Uh, and those two works are, are, are very, very interesting, elegant, as you should expect from any work of Malcolm Sabin. But um, they also have limitations in, in the type of patches that they can deal with. So it, it, you cannot even use this algorithm as it is in, in a real data, because you encounter easily the cases that they cannot handle. Finally, we have these splines, which is an entirely different type of spline that has one interesting feature here. If you have one trimmed patch, you will have one trimmed uh, T spline patch, one untrimmed T spline patch. So the relation is one to one, which is great, right? Again, you need to approximate the boundaries, as you see in the, in, in the right picture, uh, in order to glue those, uh, uh, those untrimmed T-spline patches. So the interesting thing about these splines is that you can sort of deal with a known regular structure, uh, a, a control net that it doesn't need to be uh, regularly structured. Right? Well, okay, so all of those guys, if you consider from a practical point of view, from someone who is in industry and you need to pick one algorithm to use, I would say that there is only one right there that you could even think of because of a simple, a simple issue. If you are trying to come up with a product, for instance, say, okay, I will come up with a conversion algorithm that industry will actually accept you better have these splines, uh, uh, the, 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 the rectangular B splines or tensor product B splines as your representation. The reason is that you want to you want to create models, the converted ones, that can be accepted by the geometric models that you have out there, right? Other, unless uh, you are doing this conversion to use in, a, in an in-house uh, software that your company developed, and it, it uh, and it can it, it you develop code for simulation, you develop code for manufacturing based on the representation that you targeted as the uh, 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 as the representation that you are converting to. 
But if you are buying a software, uh, a, a geometric modeler, and you want to just create, get rid of gaps, but give give back the model to this to this geometric modeler, as many that you have in the market, like SolidWorks and and so on and so forth, you better have the representation as NURBS because they will not accept anything else. This means that you need to rule out subdivision surfaces, splines, and those triangular patches. You end up staying only with the B spline patches. So this there is this compatibility problem if you're thinking from a, the point of view uh, who uh, of someone who wants to actually create software to sell uh, and to actually get a product that you do the conversion. Now, now uh, the problem with these blinds, and this is not, not, not even a problem, it's, it, it's a challenge, is that it, these blinds work pretty well when you have a regular structure. I mean, basically a tensor product structure. When you actually are doing that conversion, you will always end up with a structure that is not regular, meaning that your control net will not, not, never be regular like a, a regular grid so the issue is that how do you deal with irregular structure luckily i think mean, people developed lots of options in the past to to actually use tensor product splines with reg irregular structure but i want to single out the work of york peters who is a collaborator of mine of, of myself and that he is developed for many years uh, uh he dedicated research many years to, to this type of of, of his clients and more uh, very recently he got to the point that he created uh, low degree splines with with very good quality that can be used in irregular uh, structure right so those are these splines that i would expect people to use uh, in this conversion pro uh, process, not anything else that was published before. And he, one of the advantages of his work, uh, on top of a, a few other things, is that unlike that work that I showed you that he uses these splines as well, but with that composition operator that raises the degree of these splines with some numbers that are not very practical, uh, the solution that York and Kasiauskas provided more recently actually it uses very low degree splines. And the most interesting thing is that I will talk about a little bit later is that it doesn't compromise the quality of the results. I mean, you can see on the on the right here those highlight lines uh, that are, are very good compared, for instance, with the ones that I showed before from the papers of Kossinger and 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 is called so and 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 the the the, the so these lines uh, uh created by you they're actually given in bb uh uh bernstein bezier form but they can be converted by just a matrix operation to uh, a, a base line format uh, and uh and this is this is basically a linear operation and uh, you end up with even uniform these splines, not even non-uniform. So they are actually easier to work with. And uh, the quality of the parametrizations are well discussed in, in his, his papers as well. So in, in practical terms, I consider that this part of the problem has a good solution, right? You, if you want to use, uh, what, what kind of representation should you choose uh, to solve the problem, th this is the one. Right? Uh, compared to whatever you you can have uh, available in, in in the literature, whatever else. Now, what is the biggest issue for me? And this is what I would like to bring uh, as a message in in this talk. Is that if you consider all papers that I showed before, they have one common shortcoming. Is that they deal with trimmed patches in isolation during the conversion. What does that mean? Well, it means that they look at one patch at a time and tries to do something with that patch. Even if you are using a trim, a T spline, you are converting one patch that at a time as 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 being a unit, right? 
And this is a big issue. It's more of an issue for the, for the algorithms that are using meshes of, of the streamed patches, so meaning that they are decomposing this, this patch into smaller pieces. Why is that? Because those trim curves are not necessarily aligned with principal curvature directions of the model. And, the, the, and this is a big issue in terms of parametrization. You can have undesirable undulations when you actually go against, against the mathematical nature of the shape. Right? And another problem that is very, very important, and I think that that's when uh, I, uh, you see a, a big issue with the papers that I showed before, is that the data that they use are very, very simple compared to the to the, to the data that we actually use in practice. They did not make an effort to actually use a complex data, which are actually freely available. And I will show you the link uh, before, one of, of the possible repositories that you can uh, use to get uh, a good data. And the reason is that you get situations like that. Uh, I know that this is hard to see um, uh, uh, the, the image that I showed uh, here. There is a patch that is a triangular patch in the middle. I highlighted with green, but the lines are not very visible. But the, the idea is that this patch size uh, by no means uh, 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 correlated with the, 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 the curvature of, of the surface. So you may actually have very small patches next to very large patches. And, and this, this, this change of size varies abruptly. Imagine now that you want to, to place a, 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 a quadrilateral a decomposition of this triangular patch where I'm showing this arrow. I mean, in other words, why not treating the surroundings uh, as your unit? Why you need to confine your algorithm to one patch at a time? This idea will never be very good, right? If you have those small features, you are forcing to have very small patches there without no need for that, because maybe the local feature size there is actually large. So this, those are uh, actually this point is the point that I really uh, 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 can pin up uh, to show that uh, if you try to use those algorithms in practical data, they don't stand a chance to produce anything uh, uh, meaningful. And not and now I will tell you something that I saw uh, uh, during my experience with 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 uh, uh, data. So the experience that I had with this kind of data, I was hired by the company to actually develop uh, a surface measure for parametric models. And obviously, I had no idea about the defects of the data at the time. So I I had the opportunity to see. Uh, data that at the time was, for instance, this company was um, basically funded by uh, SpaceX. So I had access to all those models that you see in rockets of SpaceX. And those are huge models, these extremely complex parts. And they had issues of this nature. For instance, it's common in the card world that, you, you, that, that companies buy software that are called healers. Uh, this is actually an irony. I'm pu putting double quotes because I, I think that's not the kind of gear that you would like to have for your model. So the, the softwares, they try to actually minimize this gap, this gap problem. And sometimes the gap is a little bit large. Uh, and for some reason, the softwares, just the healers decide to actually create an artificial patch in a um, in between those two edges that you are seeing there. So if you try to use this, those algorithms that you saw uh, before, uh, they, they will try to mesh a very small and very thin patch, causing uh, the, the, the rise of a bunch of very, very small uh, 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 patches that you will place there uh, in, in, during the conversion process. right? No, those papers didn't mention a single word about this, those problems in the data, but they are actually real problems that you need to deal with if you, if you actually want to have a practical algorithm. 
And this was the motivation for this talk, just to review some things that uh, a few things that I didn't see um, in, in, in the papers, right? not to mention the, the, the problems that I mentioned before with, uh, with alignment of, 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 of patches to uh, uh, principal curvatures. So this is basically what I had uh, to show in terms of, uh, of what uh, would be a, a critical look at the, the solutions that you have in the literature, which means that uh, for the research community, that is a very nice uh, problem to tackle uh, uh, in order to actually provide a solution that could be used by, um, by companies. Now, there is another issue that I didn't even want to deal with in this talk because this means, I, I think you need a new talk uh, uh, about that, is that industry is very peculiar about the quality of the shape, right? Depending on the industry, this problem is actually the problem. For instance, automobile industry cares a lot about those reflection lines to the point that when you look at this drawing on the right, they actually are measuring the thickness of those reflection lines and they are picky about that. So it's not even only the problem of closing gaps. In practice, depending on your application and the level of accuracy that you need to have there, you still need to, to worry about the quality of the parameterizations that you will end up with in the end. And this is a very, very complicated problem. So uh, to, to have a better idea of the problem, I would definitely refer the entire audience to this paper by York Peters where he discusses what is uh, what do we mean by a class A surface, which is a term that used in industry to refer to a set of constraints related to shape quality that CAD models must fulfill in order to be accepted by, by certain uh, applications like the, uh, the ones uh, of, of, of the automobile industry. And uh, Jörg also has a very interesting talk about that, uh, that he gave in uh, 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 SGP 2015, although this is prior to his latest results on, uh, on, on, the, on the low quality, uh, low degree uh, spline patches, like you see uh, in, on, on the, uh, sorry, on the, on the right here. So, this is something that I would, I would definitely recommend uh, if you are interested, just to see another dimension of, of this problem. For the time being, I'm happy to talk about the gap problem. And uh, with that, I conclude the talk. And I would just like to say that there is no excuse to not use real data in, in your research, right? You have free access to millions of CAD modules in this website. And this is one website. Unfortunately, this website doesn't allow us to create like a script to download 100 modules at a time. I mean, you actually need to do it manually. So what I usually do is that I pick some time of the day, download 10 a day, then with doing that for quite some time, I, I, I created a huge data set for myself. and. Um, you also have free and open code for importing CAD modules that will give you an API that uh, allows you to access the NURBS, the trimmed NURBS representation. So if for you to have an idea, the commercial equi equivalent of, of, of this kind of software is something uh, that probably the cheapest one will be $25,000, uh, right? But you can use a free one, which is not the greatest thing uh, ever. But I mean, for as far as research goes, you, you can do something about it. You may not be able to open every possible model. Uh, there are some issues that I, I did not uh, talk about here uh, related to the, the import uh, of CAD models. Um, but this is also well known and you can find in blogs as well. But the, 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 the software itself, at least the code you can have access 
and you can do research in academia without spending any dollar, uh, just by using good data and some free code. And uh, okay. so with that, I, I, I conclude the talk. I would like to thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Marcelo. It was a really great talk. Um, I have some questions, but uh, I will start with one from the audience because very interesting one. Uh, Luis Henrique is asking if you are suggesting that geometric models should include semantic information from the original design, at least about the original shape before meshing. Actually, th this is a very interesting question. I, 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 would I mean, I would like to salute Luis and Hick and we have been exchanging mails, um, in, in paper reviews, but I haven't seen uh, him and, and Luis Valley for quite some time. Um, so the, the, it's interesting to, 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 to know the following. When you actually uh, have a, a, a CAD model in a file, like a step file, which is a neutral file, um, and you read that information that is there, actually the surfaces themselves, they may not even be all uh, nerves. They actually can be implicit surfaces. In general, they are when they are cylinders, the algebraic surfaces, the torus, and something like that. But after reading the file, the first step that you do in the code is to ask uh, the, 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 the SDK, the, 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 the API, to convert everything to nerves. So at that time, I mean, obviously, you are losing the information that, that could be crucial to deal with those uh, uh, representation in, in, in some other way. Um, I, I believe that uh, adding semantics would be great. And I, I would not be surprised if uh, that was already done before. But what the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that um, I, I'm looking at this problem uh, from, from someone who is in industry and, and whatever you, you want to do to solve it, if you want the solution to be accepted by industry, you better work with whatever they give you, right? Um, you can't expect more. But obviously, as, as, as far as research goes, if you have an idea to add value to something, why not? Uh, so th this is good. And I believe like even knowing that before this conversion uh, to, um, to, to, to NURBS, uh, when you already, uh, already have the algebraic surfaces, you could even do something more right? than uh, maybe even help with the algorithms for surface-surface intersection or something like that. Great. No, that, that's, uh, uh, when you go for the real application, this kind of a, a problem start to uh, limit the possible solutions. And, and it's interesting to see that. And, and uh, I, I like your opinion about, because you said, okay, you have data set, you have uh, 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 APIs to work with, but sometimes I believe the problem of the academia is the, we don't have the right problems, the problem that really can impact the, the industry. How you can see that for the, this uh, uh, CAD, University. There is some way to create, they, or there is already, right, there is some open problems that it's really like you well, described this, this one, or because how you see actually, this? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Uh, if you want. Emilio? No, no, okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think uh, from my, my, my point of view is that what I, I showed you uh, in this talk is that uh, I think that what I, sh I call the shortcoming, this part is actually imp the important one, right? I mean, what I think those algorithms are missing is that they are looking at one patch at a time. And uh, I wish I could review uh, the ideas that I, uh, I'm working on, on this problem with your Peters, right? But we still, uh, we are still developing our own solution. So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, the guidelines for the, the, the solution that we want to, 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 to use. 
and the, 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 what we identified as, as, as weakness uh, in, in the papers that we saw are exactly those ones. So I think the problem is somehow very well defined. It's, I don't see any problem with academia. Academia is a solution, right? So no, it's no. not <laughs> like in the sense that uh, we know what, what, uh, what the problem is. I think maybe, uh, uh, I mean, the other algorithms uh, uh, that were proposed, um, they, uh, they probably, I mean, if they didn't, if you look at the papers, they do not have any complex data there. So the, we start with this type of problem. Right? I mean, you are considering uh, patches that are very sparse, like the hood of this car, right? like we saw here. If you are if you are working with this type of data, you are fine because, like, look, the patches are very sparse. You do not have any issues there, other than perhaps to 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 be able to do something that that creates good parameterizations, which is not the case here. But the patches are favorable, uh, right? I mean, they're sparse. You do not have issues like the ones that I'm showing here, right? Uh, in the in 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 this in this in this picture. So this is this is I think the problem is somewhat well uh, 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 defined, and the issues are those ones that I mentioned. Uh, the, the, the problem is that the solution is not simple. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Yes, but just to be clear, that I'm not saying that the problem is with the academia solution. I'm saying that sometimes for academic, it's hard to get problems that really have impact directly for the, the industry. And oh, even yes. with you, that, that's one, that's the, the point. And as it's in, in, in kind of a, 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 a trend now, that's how you see if or if it's possible to see uh, the machine learning, the advance of machine learning to help on this kind of problem with cat like or finding bad meshes or helping to classify mesh or helping to to, to... well uh, I, i'm not an expert on machine learning so i don't even feel minimally qualified to, to, to give an opinion on, on 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 anything like that what i see what i saw uh in 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 industry and i think this is a very interesting problem for machine learning is on the application side in 3D printing. One of the, well, that, that was actually the, the, the secret of, of the company I, 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 I worked for uh, before Align. So the idea is that uh, when you are trying to print a model, like uh, to, to fabricate, right? Like uh, um, for instance, a model that is, 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 is for a metal based printing, printer, like the one we had in the company. The printer will deform the model in a way that you do not want or expect. This is unavoidable in the, in the technologies that we have now. So what uh, the companies do is that they try to predict the deformation and counter attack it. And obviously this is a very good setting for machine learning because the company I worked for they developed a theoretical model uh, and solved the problem in the classical way using finite element. And the solution was great, but it took like sometimes eight hours to create, uh, to, to generate the solution, including the meshing, the, everything, right? Before printing. And what industry realizes is that this type of time is unbearable uh, for some applications. And they said, okay, what if we just train uh, some data set to learn how the printer deforms and, and the model and learn how uh, we can tune the parameters of the printer to uh, avoid this kind of situation. So this is where machine learning is making a huge impact uh, in the area. But I do not know if uh, uh, for the problems that I just mentioned here, I, I would have some uh, something that I could say, oh, this machine learning will, will just be used. But that can be just by my uh, own ignorance, not uh, because it doesn't have any use. No, no great. Yeah, from, great thing. from my, from my experience yeah, yeah, using, um, I'm working a bit with uh, geometric uh, deep learning. So um, they, there are many limitations on, on the use of those because they, there are some premises, for example, 
if you're working with meshes, the mesh should be too manifold. So um, it's uh, quite like it should. So it should be similar to a continuous uh, manifold. Okay. Then uh, in practice, when you get real data, it's uh, they're seldom like that. Mm -hmm. They're they they have noise. They have holes. So you have to pre-process yes. those before um, inputting into into machine learning uh, techniques. Yes. yes. This is a whole different issue, but it, but it's similar <laughs> in nature. But it, it, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, it, it's exactly it, it, in, in 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 this industry. It's also a very a very common problem, as well. I think we have a question from, sure. from the audience here. Please, Gabriel Sanchez. Um, Hello, Gabriel. Nowadays, how does the industry approach? How does the industry approach the gap problem to manufacture products? Well, Do they go with approximations? Yes. Well, the, the, the thing, the, that's a very interesting question. Well, I mean, they do not have a solution, right? So it, 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 what, what happens is that if you are using a simulation, you, you, you generate a mesh out of the CAD model. So there are softwares to do that. So I developed the one for this company. And but but it's a it, it, the, the, the value of the software is is the cost is is very high. Like if you buy a, a commercial package for that, uh, it's it's a very uh, a very costly uh, uh, component of, of the solution. But that's that's fine. Then when you go to manufacturing, you, you need to to do something. For instance, in this 3D printing company, we didn't care very much for being very precise in terms of the geometry. So uh, it would be possible to use the, the, the piecewise linear, the meshes, even to create uh, uh, the models that we would print. But if you are in an automobile industry, that, that's not an option. And not to mention that, I mean, uh, the, all this advent of IGA uh, for the isogeometric analysis, I mean, they really want to use the surfaces. They, they want to get rid of meshes in the sense that it's a very hard problem. Even to generate a mesh of a surface, imagine just to, to, to do volumetric meshes uh, in, in this field, it's also not only costly, it, it's a tough problem, right? So, uh, I mean, if you have, uh, IGA is basically using Stokes theory, right, which is great. I mean, just get rid of the volume and stay with the surface and th this is it. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are all, almost on top of our hour again. That was very interesting. I don't know if someone has more questions, but let me thank you, Marcelo, which was really great talk and, and very good to see you again and, and have the opportunity to, to listen from you that's always always was great and i don't know if uh, uh, mostly has another question or consideration no, just uh, just to thank marcelo for uh, being with us here there are many people uh, well sending you some hello from from brazil oh. marcelo walter um, wow. Davi Menotti, Afonso Paiva, wow. Wallace wow. Kazaka, Enio wow. Russo. Wow. So. Wow. <laughs> it, it will only miss, uh, make me miss more uh, of, of, of the opportunity that I mean I would have if uh, obviously uh, we could meet uh, presentially, right? But I Gustavo really, I, I would really like to, to thank all of you for, um, uh, especially you and, and, and Emilio for um, for inviting me and just say hello to all my, my colleagues. Uh, I still try to be in touch with the uh, research community um, somehow. And, uh, you know, I owe a lot to all my collaborators uh, uh, that uh, who are Brazilians uh, mostly, like um, Luis Velho, um, Afonso, Paulo Palhosa, Mario Lisier and, and uh, Dimas, so many. <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid I can I, I can forget names. So, uh, but yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, again. Luis Gustavo. Oh my God, <laughs> one of my idols. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks again, um, Marcelo, for the great talk, and I think we can. Um,
go for the um, for the final part of this workshop, which will be the announcement of the of the paper. If you can, um, yeah, there is a slide left. And while you while we were waiting for the slide. Thanks, uh, Luis Henrique. I'm here yeah, by Rio de <laughs> Janeiro. <laughs> so this year at the um, workshops of, of workshop of industry applications, we had this. Uh, we contact the editors from IEEE Computer Graphics and Applications, and they were going to consider the, the best paper for possible publication at the journal. So this uh, the, the selected paper was presented here today. Um, it is a comparative study of methods based on deep neural networks for self-reading of energy consumption in a chatbot application context. So the idea now is that the authors should um, extend their paper and, um, and write it in a way that's, uh, that suits the, the, the journal um, and the journal scope. So we are going to contact you soon about this. So congratulations to the authors and thank you for the submission to this workshop. Yeah, I think we are um, at the end of this, uh, this morning session here. Um, to wrap up, I would like to thank everyone that was uh, with us today, the audience, um, lots of uh, people uh, that I know that I also also miss from from having a presential contact um, and thanks also Emilio for being a co-chair with me and discussing the ideas and having uh, regular meetings uh, and yeah it was a pleasure to work with you thanks also to Gastal and uh, uh, Afonso for inviting us thank you Monsieur, for being a, a, a such hard, to work, hard worker and did most of the work in fact that was great work with you that's your and, and thank for everyone for the being here as well and Gaston and, and uh, uh, Afonso for the invite <coughs> and for all of the sponsors as well thank you I believe you can close it and oh we have we have to announce the next section as well yeah I'll also mention Marcelo Walter and, and uh, David Menotti. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah, I think we have the, 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 the uh, last slide, which would be, which will point you to the, the, next, um, the next session, which is uh, technical session nine, pattern recognition and application. So I hope you can uh, watch it as well. Thanks for uh, being with us. And yeah, that's it. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.